Welcome back to Anatomy and Physiology on Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. In this video, we're going to cover the major steps of skeletal muscle contraction. We'll begin with initial excitation via the motor neuron that innervates that particular muscle fiber or muscle cell, and then end with the ultimate contraction of the sarcomere, so sarcomere shortening. And typically these two major events are termed together excitation-contraction coupling. And with this process of muscle contraction, we can really subdivide this into three major parts. We have the initial excitation, and then two, we have the sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium release. In order to get muscle contraction, shortening of the sarcomere, we have to have calcium released from the SR. And then last, we have cross bridge cycling, which we'll actually, actually cover in a separate video. So let's begin with the initial excitation of the muscle fiber. So first of all, here's our first step. We have here the axon of the motor neuron, and this enlargement down here at the bottom is the synaptic end bulb. This is going to be where vesicles containing a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine are stored. Down here is a specialized region of the muscle fiber called the motor end plate. It's going to contain these receptors down here, which we'll cover in a few slides. These are going to be sensitive to the acetylcholine, but we're not actually going to have any muscle contraction until this acetylcholine is released, and so that's going to be triggered by an action potential moving down the axon of this motor neuron. And so I usually use this lightning symbol to denote where we have an action potential. The action potential is literally the opening of voltage-gated sodium channels that open sequentially down the motor neuron axon. So again, we have four right here. This first one in blue, this is one of our voltage-gated sodium channels. This would open, and it would allow sodium to influx from the extracellular fluid out here into the cytoplasm of the axon. And of course, there would be something over here that would trigger this to open. So when this sodium influxes into the cytoplasm of the motor neuron axon, there's going to be some positive charges here that built up. Those positive charges are going to be sensed by the next voltage-gated sodium channel, which will then induce it to open, allowing more sodium to influx from the extracellular fluid out here into the motor neuron cytoplasm of the axon. And again, you're going to have more positive charges built up, and this process is going to repeat down the axon. And so you get unidirectional opening of voltage-gated sodium channels down the motor neuron axon ultimately toward the synaptic end bulb, okay? And this literally is the action potential, okay? Now at some point, the terminal voltage-gated sodium channels are gonna be open through the action potential, and you're gonna get, of course, positive charges that come into the cytoplasm here. And some of those positive charges are gonna be in the vicinity of the synaptic end bulb, where instead we have voltage-gated calcium channels. So these are actually localized in the membrane of the end bulb of the motor neuron axon. And so these positive charges are going to move over here, and the voltage-gated calcium channel will sense that. That will trigger this voltage-gated calcium channel to open, causing calcium to influx from the extracellular fluid out here into the cytoplasm in here of the motor neuron end bulb. Now, in the end bulb, as we mentioned at the start of the video, there are vesicles containing the neurotransmitter acetylcholine. Normally, these vesicles will just stay here inside the end bulb and will do nothing. But once these voltage-gated calcium channels open and calcium influxes, we're going to see a series of events that are beyond the scope of this course that allow the vesicle to fuse with the membrane here and ultimately dump that acetylcholine into this synapse, which is a space between this axon right here and the motor end plate. And in the context of muscle, this synapse is called the neuromuscular junction, which we typically abbreviate NMJ. And so what you see here is these vesicles have exocytosed their contents, that is acetylcholine, into the neuromuscular junction. And what will happen from here is they will diffuse down their concentration gradient, basically in the direction toward the motor end plate. Now, on the motor end plate membrane, which is a specialized part of the muscle cell or muscle fiber, they're the same thing, we have these receptors here in blue. These are acetylcholine receptors. And so as you would imagine, acetylcholine, once dumped into the synapse, into the neuromuscular junction, will diffuse over and bind to the acetylcholine receptor. 
Now, when this happens, it's important to understand that these acetylcholine receptors are also ion channels, and they allow movement of both sodium and potassium. So while acetylcholine is bound to this receptor, sodium is allowed to influx into this cytoplasm of the muscle cell, which is termed sarcoplasm, and also potassium is allowed to efflux or move out of the cytoplasm into the extracellular fluid. The key here to understand is that more sodium influxes than potassium effluxes. And so the net result in the vicinity around these ion channels is you have depolarization. So you have a net buildup of positive charges inside the cell. Okay. Um, sometimes these acetylcholine receptors will be termed ligand-gated ion channels or chemically-gated ion channels because a chemical or ligand called acetylcholine must bind in order for sodium to influx. But in this vicinity, we have plenty of positive charges built up, as you see right here. So we have a local depolarization at the motor end plate. As these positive charges accumulate in this vicinity, we see that there's some nearby green ion channels, but these are different. These, in contrast, are voltage-gated sodium channels. So these voltage-gated sodium channels are sensitive to this positive charge that built up due to the chemically-gated ion channels right here. And so they sense this buildup of positive charge, and the first voltage-gated sodium channel opens. And then we get sodium influx leading to another buildup of positive charge here, which is then sensed by the next voltage-gated sodium channel. And then that will allow sodium in and so on and so forth. And as we get the sequential unidirectional movement or opening of these voltage-gated sodium channels, that is the action potential that propagates along the muscle cell membrane, which is also termed the sarcolemma. This will also occur in this direction over here from left to right. The same thing is happening. This is the muscle cell action potential. Now it is worth mentioning that with any action potential, there's also following the voltage-gated sodium channel opening, there's a voltage-gated potassium channel that opens as well, but that has that follows the voltage-gated sodium channel. The action potential is the sodium channels opening like this. And so we're just kind of neglecting the potassium channels here for the sake of simplicity. But as soon as this first voltage-gated sodium channel opens, around the time that the next one opens, a potassium channel right here would open, allowing potassium to efflux, repolarizing the membrane. We'll talk about that process more when we look at neuron physiology. But again, we have the action potential moving unidirectionally along the muscle cell membrane. Now, at some point, this action potential is going to be moving along, and it's going to encounter something called the T-tubule system or the transverse tubule system. The transverse tubule system are basically canal-like structures that allow the action potential to move deeper into the muscle tissue. If we just look at action potentials moving like this as we typically draw them, those would only activate parts of the muscle, that is muscle fibers that are superficial. But if you're going to have a strong contraction of a muscle, you need to also activate deeper muscle fibers. And so this action potential moving into the transverse tubule system allows deeper muscle fibers to also be activated, but it's also necessary even for superficial muscle fibers. All right, so we have the action potential moving along. Voltage-gated sodium channel opens, sodium influxes. Then the next voltage-gated sodium channel opens, sodium influxes. This pattern continues with the voltage-gated sodium channels in the T-tubule system, these canal-like structures, but eventually that action potential is gonna reach a calcium channel that's also voltage-gated. So if we look right here at this voltage-gated sodium channel where my mouse is, sodium would influx eventually, and we get a buildup of sodium ions or positive charges inside the cell right here. And again, this calcium channel is voltage-gated. It would sense those positive charges, and that would cause this voltage-gated calcium channel to open. However, this voltage-gated calcium channel is special. Sometimes it's actually called the DHP receptor. When calcium influxes through here, it triggers a mechanical conformational change that causes the opening of this ryanidine receptor. So this ryanidine receptor is essentially a channel that connects to this organelle, which is called the sarcoplasmic reticulum, or SR. 
The sarcoplasmic reticulum, or SR, contains lots and lots of calcium ions and stores them in the event that you need to contract the muscle. And so ultimately, when calcium influxes here, it triggers a series of events that ultimately leads to the movement of calcium from the SR into the muscle cell cytoplasm or the sarcoplasm. 